In this module, we'll cover the details of the Census Bureau's Supplemental Poverty Measure. This measure was developed to address many of the shortcomings of the official poverty measure, which we discussed in an earlier module. Recall that any poverty measure consists of a measure of resources, cash income in the case of the U.S. official measure, and some threshold that establishes the level at which these resources are considered adequate or sufficient. Let's begin with the measure of resources. First, the Supplemental Poverty Measure, or SPM as it's called, looks at family income, but defines family slightly differently than the old measure. The SPM includes in a family all related individuals at the same address, along with co-resident unrelated children cared for by that family, and any cohabitors and their children. This recognizes that family arrangements have become more complex since the 1960s when the official measure was crafted. A second change to the resource measure is among the most important aspects of the SPM. Rather than using only cash income before taxes, the SPM takes a broader measure of income. The SPM counts cash income and in-kind benefits that can be used to meet needs for food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. The chart shown summarizes the major additions and subtractions from income in the SPM. The major additions to income are nutrition programs such as SNAP, school lunch, and WIC, and housing and energy assistance. From that broader measure of income, the SPM subtracts parts of income that cannot be used to meet basic needs of food, shelter, utilities, or clothing. The main subtractions are taxes, or the addition of tax credits, work expenses, including child care, child support paid, and out-of-pocket medical expenses. Next we need to consider the threshold part of the SPM. The poverty threshold or poverty line for the SPM differs from that for the official poverty measure. The SPM threshold is based on the 30th to 36th percentiles of expenditures by U.S. families with two children on food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. This number is then multiplied by 1.2. This reflects the fact that there are other essentials beyond food, clothing, shelter, and utilities such as household supplies and personal care items. That threshold is also adjusted then to account for different family sizes. One other major adjustment involves adjusting the thresholds in the SPM for geographic differences in the cost of housing. This is a substantive change from the official measure which does not make adjustments for differences in the cost of living. Year over year, the SPM threshold is adjusted for changes in the national cost of living as well using a five-year moving average of all expenditures by U.S. families on food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. The official measure is also adjusted for national income levels, but using the Consumer Price Index, which captures price changes beyond the very essential goods. Of course, changing the poverty measure is likely to result in changes in poverty rates both overall and for certain subgroups. This figure illustrates poverty rates for the entire U.S. in 2013 and for different age groups based on both the official poverty rate and rates based on the SPM. If we think about differences between the two measures, the differences in poverty rates across age groups will make sense. Overall, the figure shows that the SPM produces a slightly higher poverty rate than the official measure for all families. To some extent, the overall poverty rate will always reflect the inherently arbitrary na nature of where we draw or set the poverty line associated with any given measure. What's more interesting, however, is that the SPM produces substantially lower poverty rates for children compared to the official measure. One of the most important reasons for this difference is that children in the U.S. disproportionately benefit from many in-kind programs, especially nutrition-related programs. In the U.S., these programs don't count as income in the official poverty measure. Once we include these benefits as income in the new measure, poverty rates among children are significantly lower. The figure also shows that the SPM produces higher poverty rates than the official measure among working age adults and those over 65. Why might this be? For working age adults, the main explanation is that the subtraction of work-related expenses from the income measure means that poverty rates for this population, with higher employment rates, of course, than children of the elderly, will also be higher. Income spent to allow individuals to work cannot go to meet basic needs for food, shelter, clothing, and utilities. Finally, poverty rates among the elderly are also substantially higher using the SPM than using the official measure. 
Here, one of the main differences is the subtraction of out-of-pocket medical expenses. Because the elderly tend to have more health-related spending, subtracting these expenditures from an income measure raises the estimated poverty rate among those over age 65. For other subgroups we might look at, including those based on geography, there can be substantial differences between the official poverty rate and the SPM. Because the SPM thresholds are adjusted for differences in housing costs across local areas, but official poverty measure thresholds are not, areas with high housing costs tend to show higher poverty rates under the SPM than under the official measure. For example, in 2013, the poverty rate in California was estimated at 16% under the official measure, but more than 23% under the SPM. Many individuals, especially those of us in California, found this dramatic increase in poverty with the new measure surprising. Most of the change, however, simply reflects the high cost of housing relative to the national average in many parts of California. The inclusion of a number of non-cash sources of income, many of which come through government programs designed to aid the poor, is an important change with implications for how we use poverty statistics to track progress against poverty. As we saw in an earlier module, it's easy to cite the lack of change in U.S. official poverty rates as evidence that U.S. anti-poverty programs do not reduce poverty. The problem with such arguments, of course, is that many of our programs do not provide cash assistance and so aren't counted in the official measure. The SPM, in contrast, allows us to see directly how particular government programs, by adding to the resources available to families, can reduce the number of families who are counted as poor. For example, this chart shows the effect on poverty rates using the SPM if particular government benefits were not available. The poverty rate in the U.S., for example, would be roughly one and a half percentage points higher without the SNAP or food stamps program and nearly three percentage points higher without refundable tax credits like the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. The official poverty measure, with all of its flaws, will remain the foundation of official U.S. poverty statistics for now. The SPM, however, does provide an alternative measure that can help give a more accurate and complete picture of poverty in the United States. If we understand the differences between the two and the reasons for them, both of these measures can be used to develop a better understanding of poverty in the U.S. and how it changes over time and across groups.